So this is um, the proof behind how we get from Fourier transforms uh, two Fourier transforms from a Fourier series. And again, the idea is that now we want to consider f of x that are non-periodic functions. So what we have so far at our disposal is a Fourier series expansion. And there are two ways of writing it. We could write it with the cosines and sines. Um, the convention we're using pulls the a naught out front just because it helps you prove that a little bit easier, among other things. Or we have the exponential form, which is this. It's just written in a really nice compact way. You just have to be a bit comfortable with uh, complex numbers. And to be really specific, what this tells us is how to represent either, truly speaking, a periodic function. We don't care about that anymore. We're concerned about non-periodic functions. Or the expansion of a non-periodic function over some finite interval. So let's just stick with 0 to t. And let's say that I have some function that looks like this. So what the Fourier series does is it basically truncates this on the interval 0 to t. And it might do a really good job of representing it, especially if it has no discontinuities, you know, all the Dirichlet conditions are met. But outside of this interval, what it does is it takes this as a stencil and then repeats it. So it takes this and repeats it, and then repeats it, and then repeats it, and repeats it. And we don't want that. What we want is an actual representation of this entire function all the way from negative to positive infinity. And you can see an issue with this if you just say, like, well, you know, maybe naively, what I'm going to do is I just take this interval t and I change t so that it's now out here. So now I'm going to do a good job of representing all the way from there to there. And why can't I just take the limit as t goes to infinity? And you basically have the right idea, but the problem is, as you can see it here, here, and here, is that if you do that, you basically get ones and zeros. Right? So there's a special type of limit that you need to do. Um, you actually need to take two things to uh, take two limits when you get from the Fourier series expansion to a Fourier transformation. And that's what we'll do. Okay? So let me redraw this, my kind of sketchy picture. So, and we have f of x. Now, this is again a non periodic function. And let's take a symmetric interval because it will make our lives easier, I swear. And we'll clip this thing at minus a and a. So we'll basically take wire cutters and just trim the function there and there. And we'll start with that. So we'll got a truncated domain of minus a to a. And then I know that this has an actual Fourier series expansion, the truncated function. In the usual way, so f of x, and we'll call this minus a to a, just once for notation reminding us we're truncating ourselves n goes from minus infinity to infinity of cn. Just because I have this much board space left, I'll use the exponential form. And i n pi x. Um, again, this is just some kind of shuffling of symbols so that we get nice looking numbers. Notice my 2a. So the period of this is 2a because we're truncating from minus a to a and my 2 go away. So that's really the whole point of this. OK, now we're going to define some stuff. So we're going to define a variable k, um, which might seem suspiciously familiar to you from waves and optics as the wave number. And you're right, because this kind of looks like 2 pi n over wavelength, um, essentially. So good if you notice that. And we'll define this thing which the first part is just a normalization, f of k a to the a c k. 
and then we'll define a delta k. So essentially this is k of n, right? Yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, so I have k, it implicitly depends on n, the, um, the integer in the Fourier series expansion. I'm going to define delta k this way. And so essentially what's going to go on is I need to define this as a limit as delta k goes to zero, such that when I take the limit as a goes to infinity, I'm left with something that actually does converge into a sensible series that does represent the function. Okay. So with all of this, these three definitions, what I can do is write something that does have a well-defined limit. So far, we're just uh, rephrasing. This is the Fourier series, but it's the Fourier series written in terms of our new terminology, and you can verify that. Okay, so we've got the 1 over 2 pi because we introduced the 1 over pi there. So we've got to unintroduce it out front, and then e to the i kx delta k. And maybe now you see where this is going, right? And then you can ask, how do we determine f of k? Because f of k has the old Fourier series coefficient in it. Well, you can determine f of k with just the Fourier series coefficient determining formula, the overlap in between that basis function, that e to the i k x, and the function itself. So again, this is nothing new. This is just rephrasing stuff in terms of um, these new variables. But these new variables are very suggestive. This we already basically have. This is the Fourier transform. This is how you get the coefficients. The question then is how do I turn this into an actual integral? So this is the limit we need. So the limit to take write it out first. So as delta k goes to 0, and then as a goes to infinity. So this is what we really want. We want to expand the interval over which we're representing the function with the Fourier series, um, not from minus a to a, but from minus infinity to infinity. So we got a whole function. And in order to do that in such a way that things don't vanish, delta k goes to 0. And that will, of course, be dk. And so what we have is limit as delta k goes to 0, which means I get to call it dk. And a goes to infinity. Oops. So the delta k becomes a dk, and then this, because we have a limit, a limit sum essentially, this uh, sum becomes an integral. Right? So now I have two things. I have a way of getting from the function to a set of coefficients. So the fk, or k, is a continuous uh, variable, so k can take on any real number. And then I know how to get f of x back. Right. So and this is kind of goofy, but this is just saying we took the limit and we end up with this relationship back. Right. So we get the Fourier transform. This is what's called the Fourier transform. And then we can untransform to get our original function back. Okay. Um, and this is fine for any function for which these limits exist. And again, the meaning of this in some sense is that uh, this is a coefficient, and this is a uh, wiggle, right? So if you think about Euler's formula, this is a sine and a cosine, I sine and a cosine. So this is basically 
wiggle with a certain wavelength, and this tells you how much you would need to put in to get your function back. So it's representing the original function as a sum over all possible wiggles. Okay, one thing about this is that this is a convention. Like this is um, the one over root two pi you might not see everywhere. I think that's the convention that's generally used in quantum mechanics, which is why we're using it here. Um, but you might see uh, one over pi, sorry, one over root pi and two root two upstairs, I think at various points. Okay. Um, I'll show you some demos with this. You can see Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in here, but I do want to do an example. Or redo the example we did in class, but do a little bit more of a slow and conscientious job because we have more than five minutes. So three minutes, actually. So let's go in between minus a and a, and then we've got a height of f naught. So this is a function that there's nothing going on all the way out to negative infinity and positive infinity. This isn't a rectangular wave. This is a pulse. Nothing happens for all of time. We get a pulse, and then nothing happens for the rest of time. Okay. So what we have is we would like to represent this thing as an integral over all possible wiggles. So one of the things that happens when we go to non-periodic functions is we don't have a finite sum. We have an infinite integral, uncountably infinite integral. So this is what we want. This is the Fourier transform. And we got 1 over root 2 pi, integral over all possible wiggles, and then overlap of the thing with the basis function. And let's call this t, because you know, this really is kind of a time domain problem. And so far, that looks good. And we have 1 over root 2 pi. So this is a great function, because it's almost always 0. And then when it's not 0, it's a constant value. So we get integrand is 0 everywhere, aside from in between minus a and a, where the integrand is f naught times e to the i k t dt. I can do that. So that pull the f naught out. i is complex, but it's still just a number. And so I plug this in, and what I get is f naught over 2 pi. I get a 1 over i k, but 1 over i is minus i. And then we have e to the i k a minus e to the minus i k a. And then there's a little bit of shuffling that goes on. At this point, you know, you should start being a little bit more and more trained to see e to the i k plus or minus. These are complex valued um, arguments. These are sines and cosines. Real valued arguments. These are hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines. But anyway, I go fishing for a little bit. I recognize this is 2 sine. And what I get at the end of the day is f naught over root 2 pi. Um, the i goes away. We have a 2, and we're left with the k. This is what's called a sink. And it looks something like this. So this is f, and it's in k space, and it's got some zeros at like minus pi over a and pi over a. So this is what you would see if you were looking in what's called the time domain. Nothing happens. You get a pulse, f naught, and then you go back to 0. If you were asking what happens in what's called the frequency domain, and basically what sort of frequencies are excited by this pulse coming in, or what frequencies you would have to use to make this rectangular wave, it would be a lot of this. So some 0, and then larger frequencies, less and less of them. Okay, So we'll get a little bit more practice with this. Um, and again, remind you guys that this is, in some sense, 
um, a basis function and some of the properties of the basis function and how you get direct deltas we'll talk about in class. So last thing again is to remind you is that you'll see different conventions for this. You might see this I think is the second most common one. You might see just one over pi which I don't think is too common and you might see two over pi. But this coefficient because this isn't a normalizable function is to some degree arbitrary.